Okay, well, welcome everyone to uh, the Topos Colloquium. Today we have Jeff Crutwell talking about categorical differential structures and their role in abstract machine learning. Um, Jeff, whenever you're ready. Thanks, David. Uh, thanks for the invitation. It's great to talk here. Um, I'm still finding hard sort of cognitive distance. So just sitting in my office here and then suddenly talking to people, you know, other side of the country, all over the potentially the world, still find it odd, but it's, uh, it's a great way to share knowledge, I guess. Um, so this is based on joint work with two groups of people. So Robin Cockett, Jonathan Gallagher, J.S. Lemay, Benjamin McAdam, Gordon Plotkin, and Dret Pronk about Cartesian reverse differential categories, which I'll talk about. And some of the stuff I'll talk about right about at the end, but sort of leading into next week's ACT talk, joint work with Bruno Gavanovich, who's here, Neil Ghani, Paul Wilson, and Fabio Zanazi. So part of what the overall program we're trying to do here is understand a little bit what's happening in supervised or machine learning uh, a little bit more abstractly. And by that, I mean categorically. Can we understand sort of some of the categorical ideas or structures that underlie what's going on in machine or supervised learning algorithms? And one thing we want to understand is sort of the role of uh, the derivative and gradient descent. So in a lot of supervised or machine learning algorithms, I'll come back later and talk about sort of a little bit more of the details of them. They'll use gradient descent to sort of try and get closer to the true value of a function. They're going to use the derivatives and uh, sort of lower the, lower the gradient to get closer to some true value. So at the core, a lot of these algorithms uses the derivative. And so if we want to understand what's happening sort of abstractly, it's sort of helpful to have an abstract categorical understanding of differentiation. And there's been a bunch of different ways of doing this. And so I'll talk about a couple of them here. In particular, I think sort of Cartesian reverse differential categories are a useful um, place, as we'll, and we'll see why, of uh, a useful abstract structure uh, to start talking abstractly about what's going on in supervised learning. But I'm going to start talking about, about Cartesian differential categories, which came up about 10 or 15 years ago. What they look like, they're sort of more natural structure by themselves. And then we'll look at this variant called Cartesian reverse differential categories. And towards the end of the talk, we'll see why there's a useful and sort of why sort of because of the type of what the reverse sort of looks like, why these are can be useful in abstract algorithms that learn things. Um, and I partly I view this as a sort of introductory or um, prelude to Bruno Gavanovich and Paul Wilson's talk at ACT next week. They're going to be talking about our joint work there. Um, this is sort of giving some of the background that they're going to be using in the structures they're talking about. So if you're interested about the stuff I'm talking about, um, definitely check out their talk at ACT next week. I think it's on uh, Wednesday. Okay, so what is the type of the derivative? What is sort of abstractly going off the derivative? So let's, the main category we're often going to be looking at here is the category smooth, where the objects are Euclidean spaces, so you can just think of them as natural numbers, and smooth maps between them, so a smooth map between Rn and Rm. Those are all the maps in the category. And if you think about a map in that category, a map from f from Rn to Rm, it has its associated Jacobian, and that's a at a particular point of Rn, if I have the Jacobian at a point, it gives you an n by m matrix. In other words, a linear map from Rn to Rm. And so usually you think of this overall operation as the Jacobian is giving you some kind of operation which takes in a point of Rn and gives you a linear map from Rn to Rm. So Rn an m by m matrix. So often think of it as this, the type of this map is like this. Now, if we want to do that abstractly, that would sort of force us to have some kind of structure of uh, some kind of closed structure, some kind of structure where the maps between objects are themselves an object to the category. So it's better to sort of uncurry that map and instead think of it as a map from Rn cross Rn to Rm. So take in a point and evaluate the Jacobian at that vector of Rn and give us an element of Rm. And this is called the directional derivative. So rather than sort of directly trying to axiomatize the Jacobian, it'll directly axiomatize the directional derivative, taking in a point and a vector and a point in Rn and a vector in Rn and giving us a vector in Rm. And so what does this look like sort of concretely? If you got it looks like a function from R2 to R defined by this formula here, you take the, you take the um, Jacobian of it and then evaluating it at a point x1 prime x2 prime is for multiply the first bit by x1 prime, second one, second one by x2 prime, and then sum them all up. So abstractly, what this is telling us is that in this category, we have an operation which taking a map from A to B, the directional derivative is a map from A cross A to B, it takes in point vector, gives us back a point of the codomain. I'm seeing chat things. Oh, what is incurring map? Sorry. Um, so in general, like currying and uncurring is if you have a map from, yeah, I might start to get a little bit to explain it. It's um, if you have a map from 
A to the set of functions from B to C. So just in general, we're talking about sets and functions. If you have a function from A to the set of functions from B to C, then instead you can think of that as a function from A cross B to C, where you evaluate um, or given a function that gives you a function, you um, transport it into a function of two variables instead. So it's sort of taking a, if I have a map which takes a set to a set of functions, I can instead think of that as a, as a function of two variables. That's sort of the uncurring thing that's going on there. But in the specific case, specifically what this map does is this, it sort of takes the, the, uh, the Jacobian and sort of evaluate each of those points. See if there's any questions on that. Okay, so what we're sort of imagining is if we want to have some category with an abstract differentiation operation, it's going to have one thing we could do is set it up as a category which has for every map from A to B, it has a map from A cross A to B. And that map is going to satisfy certain properties that we want to reflect. Uh, that reflect the properties of the derivative. So before we can talk about that, we need to have a little bit of structure on our category. For obviously to talk about products here, we need our category to have finite products. So um, we'll say the Cartesian category is a category of finite products. And we also want to talk about addition. So there's nice properties of differentiation in terms of um, additive properties. So uh, define a left additive category to be a category in which each HOM set has a structure of a commutative monoid, but it's not going to be commutative monoid enriched. It's not going to preserve uh, composition on both sides. If you look at the category of smooth maps, not every map is additive. So it won't have the structure where the maps uh, preserve addition uh, on one side, but they will preserve, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, the maps will preserve addition on one way, but they will preserve uh, addition this way. If you look at uh, sort of comes the fact that uh, addition of smooth maps is defined point-wise, you do have this kind of uh, property. And note here, I'm using composition in diagrammatic order. I'm going to use semicolon to represent that composition. So F semicolon G means first do F then G. The main reason I'm using this is because the papers, the Cartesian differential categories paper and the Cartesian reverse differential categories paper use that order of composition. They don't even actually even use a semicolon, but I want to just keep that the same if you're looking at those papers there. So it is true in general that in smooth maps, you have these kind of uh, addition preservation, but you don't necessarily always have this addition preservation. So in a Cartesian left of category, you have, you can add maps and you have a zero map and they have these kind of preservation properties, but only the additive maps, we define a map to be additive if it also preserves, uh, preserves composition. In other words, coming in. So if I have a G and H coming into F, then I can break it up as G followed by F plus H followed by F and same with the zero. So Cartesian left additive category is category of Cartesian, so it has finite products and these, and it's left additive, so it has this kind of addition structure satisfying these axioms, and these structures have to be compatible in a certain way, and the easiest way to say it is just to ask that the projections be additive maps. So that's some structure that's in the category smooth, has products, has this left additive structure as well. Okay, so if we have that sort of as our base, we can define what a Cartesian differential category was. That's defined by Blue, Cock, and Seeley in 2009. So again, the model you want to think of is the category of smooth maps between our RNs. So it's going to be a Cartesian left additive category, so it has products, it has this addition structure, and for every map from A to B, there's an associated map from A cross A to B, which in the case of smooth maps is a directional derivative. And now this one, we're not going to ask you to satisfy a number of axioms sort of corresponding to properties of the derivative. So first of all, some basic ones, the derivative of zero is zero, the derivative of f plus g is the derivative of f plus the derivative of g, the sort of standard differentiation rules. Now the derivative, when we go back and look at the direction of the derivative, the sort of an input of an A and an A, but remember those sort of A's have two different types. These sort of think of these as points and think of these as vectors. So this is, you, know, you take the Jacobian evaluate it at this point and then times this vector here to get you this vector. So if I put in a zero vector there, I should get back zero. Or if I add two elements of that component, I should be able to add those separately. So sort of additivity in the second variable. Uh, the derivative, if you look at the directional derivative of the identity map, this is the identity map on some object, it's going to be a projection. It's like uh, if you take the derivative of the identity, you just get um, you know, sort of the identity matrix. So then 
bring in a, an A, you'd get back in that same A. Derivatives of projections kind of work similarly. Derivative of projections turn out to be a composite of two different projections. If you do pairing, the derivative of the pairing of F and G, so notation we're using for the pairing of two maps, is the derivative of F paired with the derivative of G. And if you look at, you think about how uh, differentiates to define, that all makes sense. And there's three sort of more interesting rules. Um, the chain rule, you can write down what it looks like in this language as well. So this formulation here is basically the ordinary chain rule you're used to, especially if you look at f and g, both real valued or real functions of real variables just from r to r. So this is saying um, to evaluate the derivative of f composed with g, you do derivative of g at f in the direction df. So g prime at f of x dot f prime of x. So this is just that um, written out for the directional derivative. The other two are sort of more interesting and a bit weirder as well, sort of not clear what they're doing at first. Um, this one says if you take the directional derivative of the directional derivative, so you do it twice, you'd get a map. So be from A cross A to B, take it its directional derivative, you get a map from A cross A cross A cross A to B. So take in four components. If you put a zero in this component here, it turns out it just collapses to a single derivative and just with this first and last component. And I'll come back to why that makes sense, but in a sense, it's sort of expressing not just the additivity, but the linearity of the derivative. And there's also a nice rule about the symmetry of mixed partial derivatives. So d of d of f is gonna have some d squared terms in it. And the way you can express the symmetry of mixed partial derivatives, so d squared f dx dy is d squared f dy dx, turns out to nicely be framed in this way that if I, I can switch the two interior variables here, Oh, sorry, that should be, this should be v2, v1. Sorry about that, it's a typo. It should be x, v1, v2, w here, and x, v2, v1, w there. So this is just saying I can switch those two terms there. Sorry, it's a typo there. It should be v1. So when you, if you work out what this is asking for, it really is just asking, uh, it just comes down to the symmetry of mixed partial derivatives. So a Cartesian differential category has this operation taking a map from A to B, giving you a map from A cross A to B, satisfying these seven axioms here. Okay, so examples. So the main example is sort of thinking of as mentioned is smooth, carry smooth maps between RNs. You could restrict that to say polynomial functions between up chains layer between RKs. Um, you could look at sort of Zn polynomials between Zn k's. Other examples as well, um, sort of infinite dimensional examples as well. So here we're talking about sort of finite dimensional spaces, but there's these things called convenient vector spaces, which are a nice setting for infinite dimensional calculus. So there are certain infinite dimensional vector spaces which have a nice uh, have some nice enough properties that you can talk about a derivative between them. And you can develop all sorts of differential calculus and differential geometry for convenient vector spaces. These also form a Cartesian differential category. A really nice semi-recent example is the abelian functor calculus. So this would be a whole other story to talk about functor calculus and the abelian functor calculus, but it's sort of uh, it's initially developed by Goodwillie, a way of talking about uh, functors and derivatives of functors and how they give you interesting information. And at the time when Goodwillie developed, it was a sort of analogy, was sort of thing like differential calculus does this, I can develop this thing called functor calculus, which has sort of formal similarities to calculus, but isn't exactly the same. So a really nice thing of this theory is that Cartesian differential categories allowed for a bridge between ordinary um, calculus and abelian factor calculus by showing they're both examples of Cartesian differential categories. So they're both, it becomes no longer just a, uh, ab, just a sort of uh, loose analogy, it becomes a real precise um, statement that they are both examples of a more of a formal categorical structure. And this is of course a great goal you want to do anytime in category theory, you want to uh, take things that were formerly just analogies in mathematics and turn them into precise statements. So there's a nice paper here called Directional Derivatives and Higher Order Chain Rules for Boolean Functor Calculus by this series of five authors going by initials Bjort. Great, uh, you just say, great title for their, for the paper, great uh, name for the authors, um, which talks about how Boolean Functor Calculus can be seen this way. Um, there's lots of other sort of things people developed as categorical theories of differentiation. And a lot of them sort of relate, can be related to Cartesian differential categories. So synthetic differential geometry, if you've heard of that, um, Inside a model of synthetic differential geometry, you can focus on the Euclidean R modules. So there's a 
a ring object R in a model of SDG and there's thing called Euclidean R modules and those form a Cartesian differential category. Those are kind of the analogs of, of uh, the vector spaces. Uh, people are talking about differential lambda calculus in uh, abstract computer science and uh, linear logic, and these are Cartesian differential categories. This is sort of one of the motivations for developing a definition as well. There's these things called differential categories as well. The Coke-Leisley of them is a Cartesian differential category, and um, Koch and uh, Reyes, I think, developed these things called Fermat theories. They're types of um, Levere theories with some extra kind of things, uh, extra sort of stuff on top of them, like talk about differentiation. Those give Cartesian differential categories as well. Some examples. Um, just a few things you can talk about in a Cartesian differential category. You can talk about when a map is linear without any reference to any kind of vector space structure, which I think is very nice. So we talked about when a maps in a left additive category are additive, they satisfy this, but notice we don't have anything here about any particular object of scalars or anything, but oops. You can talk about when a map is linear in one of these things. If you think about what happens with a linear map, if x goes to 3x, you take its derivative, you just, you take its directional derivative is just uh, xa gets mapped to 3a because you take the derivative, you get 3, and then you're multiplying it by that vector a. So linear maps have this nice property that their directional derivative has this very simple form. So we can define in a Cartesian differential category which maps are linear. And so in a lot of the examples I was talking about before, it agrees with the ordinary notion of linear. Um, even in the abelian functor calculus, they had a notion of sort of what li the linear maps were there and it agrees with this definition here. You can also talk about, extend this a little bit and talk about when maps are linear in a certain variable. So I've got a two variable map from A cross B to C. Um, you take its directional, you take its derivative, it'll be a map from A cross B cross A cross B to C. You sort of insert a zero in there. That's like saying, I just care about the derivative in the A component. Well, if it's, uh, sorry, I'm asserting a zero there. I'm sort of killing the A component. I just care about what the derivative is in the B component. And if that sort of simplifies, just like ordinary maps simplify uh, when they're linear, if it simplifies like this, then that would be correspond to them being linear in that variable. And so when I was talking about CD6 before, if you unravel what CD6 says, it's really just asking that the derivative itself be linear in its second variable. The derivative itself goes from A cross A to B, and then asking that if I take F to be F in here to be the DF there, it's exactly what CD6 is asking for. So that's why it has that particular form. It does that um, this form here, or if I punch a zero in there, I get back the DF, what I started with. So we can talk about linear and general, we can talk about what maps are linear, which maps are linear in certain variables in a Cartesian virtual category, and that this axiom is really saying the derivative itself is linear in its second variable. That's something you can define in the Cartesian differential category. I want to make this connection with uh, the simple vibration. So if I have any Cartesian category, you can define this thing called the simple vibration over X. And it really is pretty straightforward. It's a new category with objects pairs from the original category. And a map is a pair of maps, but not just from the first component to the second component, first component to the first component, and the second component to the second component, but it has this kind of, uses both the terms here. So it has a map from A, A prime to B, B prime as a pair of maps. Uh, one from the A to B, another one from A cross A prime to B prime, so taking in both these inputs and giving me something in the second component, which is kind of like what the directional derivative is looking like. And it's sort of straightforward to define how composites work in this category, just sort of apply F and F prime together and then do G prime. Um, so if I have a Cartesian differential category, I could look at the subcategory of the simple vibration consisting of maps whose second component is linear in that second variable. So that's a subcategory of this one up here. And if you know about vibrations, both of these um, give vibrations over the base category X. So why discuss the simple vibration? Because the point is that part of what's happening with the Cartesian differential category is giving you a section of this, this linear vibration or more generally this simple vibration. So I have this, um, a section of this would be a map going back from X to lin X and I, define it by sending an object A to the pair AA and sending a map F to the pair FDF. So kind of putting the function and its derivative together, I get a map in the simple vibration. And the chain rule is just saying this operation is functorial. So if you look at how the composites are defined in the simple vibration and think back to what the 
chain rule said here, you can see that sort of immediately the fact that this operation from X to the simple fibration or the, or the, the subcategory of linear maps, the fact that that's functorial is exactly the chain rule. So this is one way to express sort of categorically what's happening with the chain rule. There's other ways as well um, that it, in essence, the chain rule is just a kind of functorial. It's just a functoriality of this particular operation. This isn't, I mean, that particular aspect of the chain rule is a new people sort of realized that for a while. Okay, just before we go on to Cartesian reverse differential categories, I wanted to just mention one other sort of related structure called tangent categories. So Cartesian differential categories are kind of nice, but in a sense, they're too simple to do differential geometry. If you know about differential geometry, you're looking at smooth manifolds and trying to understand how to do differential like things in the category of smooth manifolds. And rather, um, Smooth manifold is not a Cartesian differential category. The problem is that uh, every object really has an associated tangent bundle, which is all the sort of tangent vectors at any point of the smooth manifold. And this is a functorial operation given a map from M to N. There's an associated map TF from TM to TM. And that's sort of like the derivative for smooth manifolds. And you can abstract this structure inside of the directional derivative and get what's called tangent categories, first defined by Rositsky in 1984. And this service has a structure where you have a category with some endofunctor like this T and has some various natural transformations. And how does this relate to Cartesian differential categories? Well, Cartesian differential categories are essentially tangent categories in which every tangent bundle is of, of the form A cross A. So in general, the tangent bundle of a manifold, especially something like a sphere, is not just M cross M. Uh, locally, it, locally, it's something across the base space, but in general and globally, it's not. Um, but if you did have that, if your objects did look like that, then if I had one of these structures here, I could define a directional derivative because A cross A is the same as TA. I apply this TF, get to TB. That's isomorphic to B cross B. I project out one of the components and I get a map from A cross A to B and that lets me define a directional derivative. So Cartesian differential categories by themselves aren't really appropriate for differential geometry. Tangent categories are the appropriate generalization. Every Cartesian differential category is a tangent category, but not vice versa. Um, tangent categories in which the tangent bundles are simple are the same as Cartesian differential categories. I want to just mention this because, you know, if you sort of know differential geometry, you realize that this kind of structure we're talking about here isn't really good enough to do differential geometry, but the point is that there is a generalization of it, uh, which is sufficient to do differential geometry. I guess the reason I want to talk is, is I've been doing a lot of work in tangent categories lately, but I think it's a really nice structure as well. Okay, so this is sort of an overview of one way you can talk abstractly understand the structure in the category of smooth manifolds and the directional derivative that exists in that category. That's fine, <laughs> but when you look at, so I'm gonna say what was sort of got an interest in this. Um, Myself and some other people were writing various papers about you know, differential structures like Cartesian differential categories, and noticed that a few people started using some of our ideas and talking, trying to do some things in um, sort of abstract kind of supervised machine learning. And I didn't at the time realize that sort of machine machine learning algorithms use the derivative at all, so it's sort of a surprise. But digging into it a little bit, there's something actually maybe going on. Um, it turns out that a lot of times in these supervised machine learning algorithms, they don't just use the, the directional derivative we're talking about here, they use something called the reverse derivative and automatic differentiation is called the reverse mode of, of differentiation. So what is that? So remember that from the Jacobian of a map from Rn to Rm, you get this linear map from Rn to Rm and we're viewing this op overall operation as a thing taking an Rn and an Rn and giving you an Rm. Reverse differentiation uses the transpose of the Jacobian. So if I start from map from Rn to Rm, the Jacobian gives me a linear map from Rn to Rm. You take that transpose, that gives you a linear map from Rm to Rm. And so if we put that together in the same kind of way, we get an operation which from a map from Rn to Rm gives you a map from Rn cross Rm to Rn. So it's kind of mixing up the direction. Notice we start here going from Rn to Rm and we're getting something not with the same type doubled, but something in the domain and something in the co-domain giving you something back in the domain. And it's kind of this backwardness uh, aspect of the reverse derivative that's really, I think, essential in what's going on, how it's being used in, in machine learning. 
So notice the type, the difference in type. At first, it sort of seems like you know you're just sort of presenting the information, the similar information in a different way. Um, I think there's sort of fundamental something going on, the fact that the reverse derivative kind of goes, you know, its type is different than the, the forward derivative. So just by comparison with the directional derivative versus the reverse derivative, again, if I start with the same map here, the directional derivative is going to take the derivative respect to x1 dot x1 prime plus the derivative of x2 dot x2 prime. So it gets me something back in R1, getting something back in here. Whereas the reverse derivative is going to be something in R2. So if f goes from R2 to R, the reverse derivative is going to go from R2 cross R to R2. So it's going to be a pair of things. Essentially, it's for a map into map for map into R, it's the gradient, but with this extra kind of I'm multiplying it by these y primes here. So it takes in an R2 and an R1 and gives me this pair of things, R2. Again, in the a lot of the machine learning literature, they'll talk about it's more computationally efficient to use the reverse derivative of the reverse mode of differentiation. I think that that's there's certainly some truth to that, especially I mean they've sort of proven that for maps into R, uh, into if you're if your map from R into R M and N is very much bigger than M, it's sort of more computationally efficient in some sense to use the reverse derivative. But I think actually there's something a little bit there's something going on behind it in terms of the types that are happening here that makes it appropriate as well. Okay, so just thinking about, you know, in general category theory terms for a CD, for a Cartesian differential category, the, the sort of forward derivative, the one we saw earlier, given a map from A to B, it's something from A cross A to B. But the reverse derivative is very different type. It, it goes from A cross B to A, again, takes a domain and a co-domain thing and gives you a domain thing. So just thinking, going back to the, our abstract perspective here, there's no reason why a Cartesian differential category with this forward derivative should have an operation like this. I mean, something uh, special was used to go back from, from a forward derivative to a reverse derivative. And pictures of what you get with the transpose of the derivative would be nice. That's true. <laughs> yeah, not very sort of geometric in a sense. Um, yeah, I mean, it's giving you this kind of gradient, right? So the gradient is telling you. Um, yeah, so like the gradient, the sort of direction of, of, uh, of uh, you know, that's going in that way. But yeah, pictures might, might have been good. Um, so, okay, so how are we going to abstractly talk about this reverse derivative versus this forward derivative? So we can talk about it a couple different ways. One, we could ask for a um, sort of a dagger structure on linear maps. So we're just seeing dagger structures and categories. These uh, abstract things like uh, the transpose of a matrix or some kind of operation which um, you know you kind of it's an evolution you do it twice you get back where you started with and has sort of a contravariance property as well so we could ask for that kind of structure uh, on a Cartesian differential category and that would give us a reverse derivative or we could also sort of axiomatize directly so just like a Cartesian differential category asked for for every one of these maps to get one of these maps the reverse derivative for every one of these maps would give us one of these maps so we'll look at both of these perspectives and sort of compare them so to talk about sort of abstractly what what's going on with this transpose operation um, it's helpful to talk about the dual, the simple vibration. So any vibration has associated dual, where uh, vibration is sort of a collection of uh, categories, which is the opposite of each category. But we don't need to know the general thing. If we take the particular case of the simple vibration and take its dual, basically what we're going to do is sort of reverse the direction of um, this component here. So remember, in the simple vibration, it was a map was a pair of maps, one from A to B, one from A cross A prime to B prime. Now, in the dual of simple vibration, a map is a pair of maps F and F star, where F, as before, goes from A to B, and F star goes from A cross B prime to A prime. So it's taking in the, a domain thing, a codomain thing, and giving you back a domain thing. And the reason, I mean, one reason this is this becoming a category that's becoming increasingly used a lot. Um, it's appeared in database theory and functional programming. Um, people often call it the category of lenses or variants of it will call it the category of lenses. And it has a kind of interesting bi-directional nature, right? It has maps which go both forward, so from A to B and backwards. So it's a pair of maps, one is which, which is going forward, one of which is going backwards. Um, and it's sort of not obvious, initially obvious that there's even a composite of these maps, but you can, I mean, in general it's true because they're this, 
this construction works for any vibration, but applied to this particular case, the composite kind of looks like this, um, where it takes in an F and a G star and gives back an F star. Yes, oh, the type of dialectic categories. Yes, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's uh, a great blog post by uh, Jules Hedges talking about lenses and their rediscovery over the past uh, since about the 1940s, going back to Goodall even, where people keep on rediscovering this kind of category and its uses. Um, and it's sort of related dialectic categories, Fleur is mentioning in the, the chat. Um, there's a whole interesting story there about how it relates to, uh, to logic and uh, particular sort of things that Goodall did. So this, I think there's something very fundamental about this category, the fact that it has a bi-directional nature to it, it has maps going, it has maps consisting of things going forwards and backwards as well. It's a really fundamental thing that um, we're still discovering uses for, in a sense, it's still understanding uh, how useful it can be. So, um, if we have a Cartesian differential category, you know, we could we'd get this dual, this this simple vibration, this category of lenses, and we could ask for to look at the subcategory where the f stars are linear and they're second vertebral. We could restrict ourselves to that subcategory as well. Yeah, the thing about lenses too, I think it seemed like at ACT last year, almost maybe every third or fourth talk, you know, mentioned some kind of thing about lenses or bidirectionality or having sort of forward and backwards things. It's, I think, again, a fundamental thing which we're realizing collectively is more and more important. Oh, so ACT, the Applied Category Theory Conference. Which the next version will be next week. Okay, so if we have a Cartesian differential category, we have both this um, categories are linear maps, maps are linear and variable, and lin star, these maps which are linear but have this kind of bidirectional nature to them. And so we'll say that it has a contextual linear dagger if we have sort of like taking the definition of a dagger category, dagger structure on a category and uh, applying it at the vibrational level. So it's gonna map from this category to this category, which is the identity on objects. Um, and just like when you have a functor from A to A op, um, you sort of you get, a, you get a sort of functor going back in the opposite direction as well. So it's not really that when composed of the self, this gives the identity, but there's a given a map like this, there's an associated map from lin star x to lin x, and we ask if that composed of itself gives the identity. Um, you know, concretely what this is saying is that having a contextual linear, if I have a map from A cross A prime to B prime, which is linear in its second variable, this structure is giving me a map from A cross B prime to A prime. So kind of flipping those types, just like the transpose would do. And if I apply it twice, I get back the original thing I started with. So we could ask, we could ask if a Cartesian differential category has this kind of structure on of a way of transporting a map from this type to a map of this type. So yeah, if we have a Cartesian differential category with this operation, then for every map this, we get this directional derivative, and then we could apply this dagger operation to get a reverse derivative of something going from A cross B to A. So again, the category is smooth would be the prototypical example here where we can take the transpose, the Jacobian, and getting a map going back in the opposite direction. So this is really the power of the reverse derivative having this kind of operation is from a map of this type from A to B, we get a map of this type A cross B to A with this kind of forward and backward mixing. So that's one thing we could do if we wanted to sort of abstractly understand, look at the reverse derivative. Um, we could ask that we have a Cartesian differential category with this kind of dagger on linear maps operation. But we could also um, axiomatize it directly. And we sort of thought at first, you know, is this really necessary, like, is this really a necessary thing to, to axiomatize this, this structure directly? I, I think it actually was helpful to, to sort of explicitly write down what rules this, this this sort of reverse derivative does satisfy. So just like before we had a Cartesian differential category, which has for every map from A to B, map A cross A to B. Now we've got this kind of reverse thing from map A cross A to B, we get a map from A cross B to A. And then we sort of just figured out what axioms this kind of thing satisfies. So just like we had those, I don't know, you go back, just because we had those seven axioms for a Cartesian differential category, we now have seven axioms for the reverse differential category. Um, and some of them are similar. So the reverse derivative of zero is zero and the reverse derivative of f plus g is the reverse derivative of f plus reverse derivative of g. Um, if I put a zero or sort of additive in the second component, that's expressed there. The identity works out as before. Projections are interesting. Um, projections and pairing are kind of interesting. If you look at the reverse derivative of projection, there's actually, it's like an injection thing, kind of at, puts in a zero. And if I take the reverse derivative of pairing, it actually turns into a sum. 
And there's kind of a contravariance nature going on here. So these kind of axioms are actually exactly the same as for a forward derivative, but these axioms a little bit different. Uh, the chain rule takes on this kind of reverse form, which is the same thing we see with the um, composite in the dual in the category of lenses. You see the same kind of composition here. That's what the sort of form of the chain rule takes. And the last two axioms are a bit ugly. <laughs> I think we we have sort of some thoughts about looking at try ways to simplify these things, but sort of translating what the linearity of the derivative and the symmetry of mixed partials looks like with a reverse derivative, it gets a bit ugly and complicated. But uh, these are the awful forms that they take. And if you expand these out, you'll see that sort of the symmetry of the mixed partials is giving you this axiom and the, the linearity is giving this axiom. So in particular though, is important one of the important points here is that if I have one of these reverse derivative operations, I'm getting a section of the category of lenses. When the forward derivative gave a section of the simple vibration, a CRD, a Cartesian reverse differential category um, gives a section of the dual simple vibration of the category of lenses. So it's taking a map, I mean, you know, sort of see that here, it's taking a map of A cross type A cross B and giving you a map of type A cross B to A in a way that preserves, that uh, preserves composition. Essentially, the chain rule, the reverse chain rule, is saying that the comp, if I compose maps in the base category and then apply the reverse derivative, that's the same thing as if I, and then compose, the same thing as if I compose in the original category and then apply the reverse derivative. So, one sort way to think about Cartesian reverse differential categories is a way of giving for every map an associated lens to it, associated bidirectional thing. Don't have too many examples yet. Um, it's sort of similar to what started with Cartesian differential categories. So smooth polynomial functions, the Zn polynomials between Zn and Ks. We're working on adding more examples though. We've got some possibilities for some other ones. Um, but for now, we don't have sort of too many wide range of examples. Uh, okay. Now I wanted to sort of mention something interesting structurally about these things before we get back to sort of how they could be used in machine learning and supervised learning. So I'm just gonna check the time. Um, so to go from a Cartesian differential category, a forward derivative to a CRDC, something that's a reverse derivative, we talked about we sort of need some of this dagger structure. But what's interesting is going back, you might think to go back, okay, I also need a dagger structure. If I started with a CRDC, if I started with just a category which has for every one of these, this operation satisfies some axioms and I wanted to get a forward derivative, something A cross A to B, maybe I'd also need a dagger. I mean, that's certainly something if we had that, we could go back. But it turns out for free, there's actually a Cartesian different, there's a forward derivative hidden inside our reverse derivative. So if I start, let's think about how we could do this. So I start with a map A to B in one of these reverse differential categories. The reverse derivative gives me a map from A cross B to A. If I do it again, now I get a map from A cross B cross A to A cross B. So I kind of get this mixing of types. But notice that here I've got an A and an A and a B. And so what could I do if I zero out this term and I project away the B, I'd be left with the map from A cross A to A. And it turns out that, that, that the axioms we defined here, showed here, give us that this operation gives a forward derivative as well. So if I start with a reverse differential category, Cartier reverse differential category, define this operation from it by doing the reverse derivative twice and kind of poking a, putting a zero there and then projecting out, I get a Cartesian differential category for free. This is kind of neat. I mean, this is something Gordon Pot can mention to us when we're talking about this with him, uh, sort of a thing that's known in the automatic differentiation community that the reverse derivative kind of, the derivative is hidden inside of it by applying the reverse derivative twice and kind of putting in the zero in the correct place and then projecting out, you get a forward derivative. And this is kind of nice because this, this we, we can now tell the story at a sort of structural level that if I have a Cartesian reverse differential category, I get a Cartesian differential category, not conversely though. You can also show that if I have a CRDC, I get a contextual linear dagger. So this tells us essentially that these two things are equivalent. If I start with a forward derivative with contextual linear dagger, some kind of transpose-like operation, I can get a reverse derivative. But if I just start with a category with reverse derivative operation, it turns out I get for free both a Cartesian differential category and a contextual linear dagger. So you know, initially you might think you'd you need that the following equivalent to CDC with a contextual linear dagger and a CRDC with a contextual linear dagger, but for free you get from uh, from a CRDC, you get both a CDC and a contextual linear dagger. Which is kind of, uh, so this is kind of a nice uh, structural result that um, 
sort of says, actually, th there was something to axiomatizing this structure on its own. It's sort of an interesting structure on its own that has hidden inside it a forward derivative. Okay, so let me just wrap up by bringing this back a little bit to machine learning. And again, this is sort of just a preview to um, Paul and Bruno's talk next week at ACT at the Applied Category 3 conference. Uh, we'll talk about in more detail how we can set these things up. But I want to give you a little bit of idea of, of how this can be used in that setting. So at a very high level in supervised learning, you have you want to learn some function. It might be, you know, A might be the set of all images and B might be uh, real numbers or numbers between zero and one. And your function is, you know, the probability that this image contains a cat or something like that. And you want your computer to learn that learn that function. Um, it doesn't know sort of what that function would look like. And how do you do this? You fix some parameter space P and build a function and set from P cross A to B. And you often do this in sort of very complicated ways, building up a sort of neural network where you've got, you know, the inputs A come in and then they're uh, weighted by various values and there's combined in various ways and eventually it spits out a B. But all those various weights and components in the neural network you can see as being elements of some other parameter space p. So at a sort of a high level to learn some function from a to b, you build some very general function from p cross a to b and then vary the elements of p until you get close enough to the function you want to learn. So you kind of hope that for some particular value of p, if I fix that p and this map, which would be a map from a cross b, will closely approximate what I start with. And you start with some, you know, carefully chosen initial value of initial value of your parameters, and you form some kind of iterative process to get new values, p1, p2, p3, and so on. And hopefully you're getting closer and closer over time to the true function. And one way to do this, you often have some training data as well. So value, the, you know, you have some values, the function which you know. So you have like, this image contains a cat. This image does not contain a cat. This image, well, 80% of the time, <laughs> kind of looks like it contains a cat. Um, you you'll feed that into your, um, your algorithm and it'll give you new values of p and hopefully over time or millions of these iterations you'll get closer and closer to the actual function that you care about. So what's actually going on the scenes there? Well the reverse derivative is sort of exactly the right type to do this because imagine we had one of these fun parameterized functions this p cross a to b map or rep representing some kind of neural network. Look at the type of the reverse derivative of it. The type of the reverse derivative is p cross a cross b to p cross a. Remember it takes in this moves into the domain and this goes into the codomain. So it says it takes in a P and an A and a B and gives you back a P and an A. And this kind of looks like exactly type, right type to do learning when you've got this kind of training data because I've got this kind of training data. Well, I have some initial parameter of my network and I have both an A and a B. I have an image and it's probability it's a cat or something like that. So I can feed that into this and get back a new P, a new parameter and this A as well. And the P, you can imagine, well, it's a new P that I could then try and iterate this process again. The A is sort of interesting as well. Um, it's sort of related to uh, deep dreaming where you um, take an image and sort of iteratively uh, sort of see what the, the network is doing as it goes along. You might sort of change the image in various ways. Um, I don't think I'll sort of, yeah, we won't talk about that more here. I don't know if I'll talk about that in the talk next week, but um, in the paper reference, I'll talk about it a little, a little bit. Um, but the point is that the reverse derivative, because of this sort of bidirectional nature, it's exactly the right type to do the kind of learning you might want. Now, this is actually a little bit of a simplified picture because um, you actually don't want to feed into it the B that you'd get from the training data itself. Because if you think about the derivative, this is sort of supposed to take in a change in B and also supposed to output a change in P. So this is where the other components of a, a machine learning algorithm come, in, come into play. Um, you sort of need a loss function as well to tell you, you know, if this is the output of my network, of my current neural network, and this is uh, the value that I care about, let's see, let's sort of measure how far that distance is away, and then we can use that component as well. And ultimately, and this is going to give us out a change in P, not the actual P, but what we do is take our current value of P, add it to the change in P, or subtract it from the change in P, and that'll give us my new parameter. So, more of the details of sort of how this fits into giving you a, a machine learning uh, picture will be talked about in the, the, uh, the talk next week. But I really want to emphasize here is that the important thing is that the reverse derivative is exactly kind of setting up to be the right type to be able to do learning because it's something which takes in a P and an A and a B and gives you back a new P. As opposed to the forward derivative, I took the forward derivative of this neural network and have something from P cross A 
cross P cross A to B. And that isn't something that I can, you know, feed into it, uh, these training data and get back new parameters, but the reverse sort of is exactly the right type. So really this is just, this this sort of line here is one of the main points I wanted to make is that the reverse derivative in general, because of its sort of bidirectional nature is exactly the right type to be able to try and learn new values as opposed to other things. And I think this is why, the sort of reverse mode of differentiation, reverse differentiation is so prominent in these kind of um, learning settings because the reverse derivative is a kind of thing which has this sort of backwards uh, flowing information. Yeah, it is sort of related to, you know, algorithms which, you know, improve on various uh, values. Uh, pictures, yeah, <laughs> pictures are maybe nice, sorry, yeah. Yeah, so, Bruno and Paula say we'll talk at Applied Category Theory next week about more of the details about how when you start with this Cartesian reverse differential category, how from that you can build up various supervised learning algorithms. At the core of it is this reverse derivative of a parameterized map like this. But then you also need to add into it the, the loss function and the gradient descent or variance of gradient descent as well. Um, so the point is that this framework is fairly general. So it starts, you can start with any Cartesian reverse differential category, um, and then you can stack on top of it various version, various um, variants of gradient descent, things like momentum, atom, etagrad, things that people actually use. Um, you can feed into it to different loss functions, tack those on to the, the pictures that one can develop. And you can vary the base category as well. It's not just from smooth. So I mentioned that you can talk about polynomials, Z2 polynomials or Z2 to the K. The reason this is an important example is because this generalizes work by Wilson and Zanazi where they talk about how to do learning on Boolean circuits. So circuits with just zero one kind of inputs, they showed in a nice paper how to do learning, how to do machine learning on those on Boolean circuits. So that was sort of a different setting than normally where normally you do machine learning with smooth functions. Um, this was machine learning with Boolean circuits. And the point is this kind of generality encompasses both of those examples. It encompasses kind of smooth learning that happens normally and the Boolean circuit learning. It's just you're just changing which Cartesian reverse differential category you're working in. So it'd be nice if we sort of develop more examples of these uh, as well and look at other learning that can happen in other places. Okay, so just to wrap up, oh yeah, just a couple minutes. So there's Cartesian differential categories and Cartesian reverse differential categories and tangent categories as well. But these, these particular ones are sort of generalizing different types of differentiation. These are about the four derivatives, about the reverse derivative. I think there's sort of inter something interesting theoretical about comparing the two of them. Um, the reverse differential categories have a four derivative inside, sort of hidden inside of them, but the Cartesian differential categories don't. Um, one of the main sort of aspects of what a CRDC is doing is turning an ordinary map into a lens. And lenses have this sort of bi-directional information flow. And so they're exactly the right place to have some kind of operation which sort of does some forward operation then um, goes backwards. And it's a sense, in a sense at a high level, what you're doing with learning, you perform some operation, you're told that was right or you were wrong and you take that information and go back and update your assumptions. So that's sort of what's, you know, the lens, category of lenses are capturing that kind of bi-directional flow and a CRDC is turning ordinary maps into things which have this property. Um, just want to mention one bit of future work. So as I mentioned, sort of in the middle, um, CDCs aren't really, they're not appropriate for smooth manifolds. Um, the minimal sort of thing for smooth manifolds is, is tangent categories of which synthetic differential geometry is sort of the nice, nice example of those. But I want to sort of develop a analog of CRDCs for smooth manifolds. And those would be cotangent categories, sort of the, just like the tangent bundle was the kind of analog when you move to smooth manifolds of, um, tangent bundle and the tangent functor, I should say, is the sort of analog of the directional derivative when you move to smooth manifolds. So the cotangent bundle, cotangent func cotangent bundle is the analog of these kind of reverse differential operations. So hopefully define abstractly what a cotangent category is, and this might be useful in understanding learning on manifolds, not just on uh, RN spaces, but that's sort of future work. I give a few references here. So I don't think I ever explicitly mentioned this, but a lot of inspiration, drew a lot of inspiration from this paper by Fong, Spivak, and Treas, back prop as functor, which is sort of really inspired the idea that you could even do category theory related to machine learning. So a lot of good insights about um, how you can even start to talk about um, machine learning in any kind of categorical way. And that inspired some thinking that we're talking about here. And then some of the References that are talking about sort of reverse derivative categories uh, as in CSL last year, 
Uh, this paper by Wilson and Zanazi is showing how to do machine learning with Boolean circuits. And again, we're sort of generalizing that. And this paper here, uh, this categorical framework for gradient-based learning, which uh, Bruno Gavanovich and Paul Wilson will talk next week at ACT. So you'll see more details about how CRDCs can sort of be combined with gradient descent algorithms and loss functions to build supervised learning algorithms. Great, I think that was all I wanted to say for now. Thank you all very much. That was great. Um, if people have questions, you can unmute yourself or raise your hand um, with the reactions button on the bottom. Um, and uh, okay, it looks like Paul has a question. Go for it, Paul. Um, okay, so I, I, I've already said it'd be nice to have some pictures, but <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I, I, on a different topic, on the sort of the category theory of this. Um, now, it, 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 it already seems odd to me um, that the derivative of function should have a completely different domain from the function itself. Um, so I wonder whether a clearer way of expressing this so this, it's the younger generation from me who do this kind of thing. And it's not, I don't really get the string notation, but I'm thinking that string notation for, for categories might be a more natural way of expressing this kind of thing where, um, where your um, domains of your functions are, are changing when you apply the operator to it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, the... I probably should have actually incorporated some of those pictures into this one. I guess I didn't want to, well, I probably should have actually incorporated some, because we have next, again, if you go to this um, talk next week, uh, the Applied Category Theory Conference, they'll, everything, they'll, they'll, they'll draw the things in this nice string diagram calculus, uh, which shows, shows the sort of forward and backward information flow, and also sort of has a separate axis for the parameters versus the input and output of the uh, the program. So yeah, it beco actually becomes a lot clearer. Some of the things that are going on by writing it out uh, string diagrammatically, absolutely. Yep. Oh, and Bruno says they'll even have animations too, which would be very cool. Um, Andreas? Uh, yes, um, I have a couple of comments. One from the differential geometry point of view I would expect that when you develop cotangent categories, they might actually be even nicer than the tangent categories for two reasons, mainly because cotangent vectors are nicer than tangent vectors in differential geometry. In just for some examples, um, you can pull back global differential forms. You cannot push forward global tangent vector fields mm. in general. Um, also, differential forms are the chief ingredient for Bamco homology, which has no, no such simple analog, let's say, in, for the case of, of tangent vectors. So th there's, uh, I think there's high hope for cotangent categories. The other comment I wanted to make, um, I'm not sure what exactly Paul wanted pictures of, but if he really wants pictures of cotangents being pulled back by this reverse differentiation, I think the place I've seen the best pictures of that is the book called Gravitation by Misner Thorne. They are obviously doing it for entirely different reasons. They need differential geometry for purposes of general relativity, but they do have some fairly decent ways to visualize what a differential form is supposed to be doing. Yeah, thanks for those. So a couple comments to reaction to that. So first of all, um, one thing that's looking more difficult about cotangent categories um, is so the tangent bundle can be seen and the tangent functor can be seen as an endo functor on the, on the category of smooth manifolds. The manifold M goes to its tangent bundle TM and a map F from M to N gives you a, um, a map from TM to TN, but the cotangent bundle isn't an endo functor in the category of smooth manifolds, only when restricted to local diffeomorphisms. So it's it's not an endo functor in the base category anymore. Now, sort of how we set up tangent categories, and a lot, you get these a lot of natural transformations between this functor and its iterates. Um, there's certain it's 
the, the cotangent bundle is instead a um, functor from the base category to the dual of its uh, analog of vector bundle vibration, the dual of its vector bundle vibration <laughs> thing. Um, and so it's a bit more complicated in that sense. Um, I know what you mean about a lot of those properties are nicer, but somehow like directly categorically so far, it seems like tangent categories involve sort of functors and natural transformations related to the base category, whereas cotangent categories don't quite have that same structure. Um, and thanks for pointing out that gravity book. I looked at that a long time ago and had lots of nice things, but I haven't thought about looking, but I haven't looked back at it in a while. And yeah, it might be useful for sort of images of cotangenty things. Great. Um, Ms. Valeria has a question. Uh, hi, Jeff. Hi. Kind of very nice talk, kind of I, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, a, a true question, do you, I mean, aren't you kind of a little bit worried that that the stuff for the uh, for the differential categories is so different from the differential manifolds? I mean, I kind of expected that when we are dealing with it kind of categorically, that the differences in dimensions would kind of um, be minimized or even disappear. So I'm kind of slightly surprised by by this um, this thing that looks like you cannot go up on your dimensions. Do, do you have any comments on, on that? What do, you mean, what do you mean by going up on dimensions? I mean, because um, thinking of manifolds and, and uh, kind of um, and tangent planes, we are going up on on, on, on on the level of the dimensions of the derivatives that we are dealing with, right? So I, I mean, I'm a little bit surprised by this big breakup between the categorical version. I mean, the categorical version sort of just working on uh, RNs versus the categorical version working on smooth manifolds. That's right. Yeah, um, I think. Um, hmm, can I say it? so? I think the picture when you go from Cartesian differential categories to tangent categories does get nicer for sure. Like this, uh, let me go back to, this structure is kind of ugly in a sense. It's sort of just some axioms that represent what the derivative is. Whereas the axioms of a tangent category are a functor and certain natural transformations satisfying certain properties. So it's, the tangent category structure is nicer and it encompasses this sort of base case, like the Cartesian differential categories are the tangent categories in which the tangent bundle is trivial. So when you do go up to the more general setting, the category theory gets nicer for the forward uh, derivative. But somehow it could be just, I don't sort of understand yet the best way to set this up, but so far at least um, going from reverse derivative to cotangent thing, looks more complicated and maybe, that, maybe there's some pointing to some problem there. And I think it's just something I still don't understand very well yet about why it isn't, it should be nicer when we sort of go to the more general smooth manifolds. I guess one quest, one point too is like starting, reason sort of started for this was somewhat historical, like Blutcock and Seeley were just trying to understand differentiation between vector spaces. I mean, there's this story that Robin told me, that Robin Cockett, part of the reason that he Develop this is because he's trying to help his daughter do calculus and he's saying, oh, this looks horrible. Let's do it categorically. So he was just trying to do, you know, multivariable calculus categorically, not, not smooth manifold stuff categorically. So part of it was this stuff started then and then um, tangent categories kind of got rediscovered. So partly it's sort of a historical thing of starting with this case and then working to tangent categories. And so then doing a similar thing with the reverse derivative and going from that to the, the manifold version. Um, but yeah, it bothers me a little bit too that the cotangent thing just doesn't, isn't working out as nicely so far, but that's, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep. We have a couple of questions here in the Tobo's office. Um, I have one. John Baez over there? Okay. Can you hear? Um, okay. Hi. Yeah, I was thinking that even in the case of finite dimensional vector spaces, if you have a linear map from A to B, you really get a linear map from B dual to A dual, mm. more natural, so that more natural than this transpose operation or dagger operation is 
is what I'm talking about, which in the finite dimensional case comes from the fact that that category is compact closed. It becomes more exciting in a way in the infinite dimensional case to where, where the vector space is not isomorphic to its tool. Then it's not a compact closed category, but, but there still is this uh, closed structure and this duality. So I'm sort of a little, a little worried that your, your main way of going from the uh, from your CDCs to your CRDCs is to use a dagger structure. Yeah, there's sort of some finite dimensionality baked into the definition of a CRDC and and the sort of dagger thing. Uh -huh. So part of that again is uh, developing cotangent categories should help with that as well, where as you say, we'd have a co every 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 object would have an associated space of cotangent vectors, and somehow you're not identifying the cotangent vectors and the tangent vectors like you do with the CRDC. So uh -huh. um, that generality should would it that generality would allow for infinite dimensional things, whereas CRDCs wouldn't. So um, yeah, that should help as well when we go to that more general setting. So do you think that's why you're having trouble getting more examples of CRDC? Or could, I mean, yeah, that, that's actually part of it. Yeah, I think that is that is part of it because it's sort of there's some finite dimensionality baked into it in a sense, yeah. Hi, Jeff. Um, hey. I really love your talk. I'm Thanks. just about that last comment on that slide towards the end you had up about uh, cotangent categories being hopefully being useful for understanding learning on manifolds. What, I'm just curious sort of what that would look like for you to understand learning on manifolds from a categorical perspective. So I guess the idea would be to develop um, a similar story to what, um, yeah, we're gonna talk about here where you sort of have um, from every sort of map in the base category, you have a map which sort of passes information backwards as well. But the map now is between manifolds rather than finite dimensional spaces. So if we sort of know what a cotangent category is, then and, and smooth manifolds are a co excuse me, are a cotangent category, then um, we'd have some kind of abstract setting in which um, we can talk about information being passed backwards both forwards and backwards between manifolds, not just between finite dimensional spaces. So that would sort of allow learning where the functions are not just between R and finite dimensional spaces, but now between smooth manifolds. Okay, so it's about seeing this bidirectional structure emerge naturally from the, the sort of the underlying structure you have available. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd love to see that too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, Bruno, you want go? Hi, yeah, I just have a comment about what was said just now that I, I didn't know that it was hard to find the examples of CRDCs. That's, that's I guess, an issue or something? Somebody a little mentioned. bit, yeah. Um, I mean, right now we only have, uh, you know, kind of these ones and I think there's some possibilities for other ones, but I think there is sort of, as mentioning before, some kind of finite dimensionality baked into Cartesian reverse differential categories. So like infinite dimensional things won't be, whereas they were with CDCs, like um, uh, community vector spaces were a CDC, but they're not, I don't think they're a CRDC. Sorry, what was that? Was, what was your question though or comment? Yeah, yeah, I guess, no, I just wanted to <laughs> hypothesize wildly. So. Uh, yeah. Based on our work that we can do this learning stuff, there's this stuff I've been meaning to get in learning and there's some exciting stuff in machine learning where they do learning on hyperbolic spaces in sort yeah. of with neural networks in the same way. So I would say, oh, I bet like these hyperbolic spaces appropriately formalized would form an RDC since they are obviously doing useful stuff with them in the same neural network styles. I, th um, I would think they would form a cotangent category as opposed oh, to- Oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or a variant of like with yeah. dependent, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, no, the, that, that there's specifically, yeah, when I was sort of talking generally about learning manifolds, there are specifically sort of the people trying to do learning, especially on hyperbolic manifolds. I'm not sure exactly why those those things specifically are better for some reason, but uh, yeah, that hopefully that general work would help inform what's going on with that kind of work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Andreas has another question. Uh, yeah, so since my first comment began from the point of view of differential geometry, I thought it would be only fair to 
continue with a rant against differential geometry. <laughs> um, well, differential geometry has, has this problem with cotangent vectors because cotangent space is defined as the dual of the tangent space. And the tangent space consists of local derivations which are functions on a space of functions. And, and so by the time you get to cotangent vectors, you have at least double dualized and maybe worse. Um, at that point, I think there's a better way to approach cotangent vectors without going through all that dualization. Um, it's used, I think, almost exclusively by algebraic geometers where they define their analog of cotangent vectors, or canonical bundle or something, in terms of maximal ideal of the ring of functions modulo the square of the maximal ideal, so that there's not all this dualization going on. And I just, partly I wanted to rant about that, and partly I wanted to point out that this approach exists and might alleviate some of the problems with, with cotangent categories when it comes to defining them cleanly yeah yeah the yeah and somehow somehow in algebraic geometry there, there's a cotangent thing and a tangent thing and somehow the cotangent thing they often say is the more natural thing than the tangent thing um and so yeah i guess part of the idea is we could maybe use that that how they do cotangent stuff in algebraic geometry as an inspiration for how to define cotangent categories um part of the issue is that i don't i find algebra i personally find algebraic geometry sort of hard to follow and read like it's just a little bit opaque <laughs> somehow, um, but absolutely, yeah. Like an algebraic. Don't read that much of it. <laughs> don't read, that's right. Just get, just get the vague things, and yeah, I, yeah, definitely. I think I think in algebraic geometry somehow the cotangent thing is a, is is natural and sort of na is naturally defined there. So this is probably just yeah, I, yeah. I need to go back to that literature maybe and, and look at it more for inspiration. Yeah. Another question here. I just or like comment. to advocate a buzzword for for finding that stuff, which is Kähler differential. Um, and so you don't even need to know about maximal ideals. You could, uh, their, their version of differential and algebraic geometry uh, has, is defined by a universal property. So it's like the universe, D of a function is the universal, the D operation is the universal derivation. And that, that you can, so category theorists should, should be able to like uh, Kähler differentials in that way. Yeah, oh, okay. the, there's a couple of papers about doing Kähler differentials as related to differential categories and Cartesian differential categories. Um, oh. Yeah, I don't know if I remember the names. They're by um, Rick Blut and Rory Lucession Wright and Keith O'Neill have some papers on Kähler differentials and their relation to differential categories and stuff. So. Great. Yeah, because there's a universal property there, which is great, right? That's always category theory. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah right, exactly. Yep. Great. So, what I think we'll do is um, well, let's thank Jeff again. Thanks, everyone. And um, we'll end the live stream. And um, if anybody, if, if you have time, Jeff, 